If you were raised on British television of the 70s and 80s, sometimes scares came from unexpected places. Doctor Who, Grinny Gog, the Kinder Surprise ad, sure. But the two Ronnies? Not lovely Ronnie Barker, with his ice cream hair and fondness for wordplay. And little Ronnie Corbett, adjusting his glasses and talking about having a bath in an egg cup. Come on mate, are you some kind of softy? Outside of their studio sketches, the Ron's more cinematic side occasionally produced the sort of unintentionally disturbing image more fitting with a post-midnight glance through the banisters. It was a bad night's sleep for any child, already high on Quality Street, who witnessed the Pinocchio parody from their 1987 Christmas special. Broken nose? Who are you calling broken nose? <laughs> But one sketch which very much intentionally trod the line between comedy and horror came in their BBC series from 1976. The Phantom Raspberry Blower of Old London Town. The first incarnation of Phantom Raspberry Blower made its debut in 1971 as an episode of LWT's anthology, Six Dates with Barker. Out of the six episodes, half would spin off into a film, short-sighted removal man sitcom Clarence, and in the case of Phantom Raspberry Blower, both a stage version and an expanded serial on the two Ronnies. Co-written by Barker and Spike Milligan, while the original ran 25 minutes, the 76 Phantom went just over an hour, across the span of eight episodes. The serialised format was a regular feature on the two Ronnies, with a new episodic tale each year, chapters of which were dropped in weekly, filled with guest stars and their trademark saucy postcard humour and elegant bon mots. Outside of the Raspberry Blower, the most notable of these is perhaps The Worm That Turned, Set in the dystopian future of 2012, gender roles have been flipped, leaving dress-wearing men as second-class citizens, crushed beneath the literal heel of jack-booted female police, in a Britain flying under the Union Jill and the fascist rule of state commander Diana Dawes. Once the men had to wear the frocks, they were subjugated. As soon as we took their trousers away, they were putty in our hands. Yeah. After all, what did they have left? Two lumps and a sponge finger. <laughs> but it was 1976's offering, along with its repeat run in the 80s, which really stuck in the minds of viewers too young to watch actual horror movies but not the pre-Watershed things which pastiched them. And as pastiches go, Phantom Raspberry Blower is a beautifully observed one, which I see as a kind of sister piece to carry on screaming. Its foggy Victorian streets and dramatic soundtrack every bit a hammer horror. In its opening titles, Chopper Films functions both as a hammer homage and in the house style, a reference to knobs. The gentleman of the credits is, of course, Barker, who often hid his light under the bushel of a pseudonym. And to go along with the opening knob gag. These credits change every week, giving a wide variety of puns, which are of diverse quality. I mean, some of these are really pushing it. London, 1898. This story starts on the night of Tuesday, October the 3rd. <laughs> if taken out of context, nobody would ever peg this as a two Ronnies, really capturing the feel of 50s and 60s horror, pea soup fog over cobbles, and a classic Jack the Ripper looking villain which is what they were parodying, except instead of disemboweling his victims. Is there a message I may give to the Prime Minister, sir? Yes. 
tell him this. Standard police procedural, the phantoms pursued by a pair of blundering coppers. He's Inspector Corner of Scotland Yard and I'm Sergeant Balls. <laughs> How do you do? What do you say his first name was? Dick. Dick? Dick? No, just one Dick. Balls, willies, farts. The lads had a bit of a rep as muck merchants, dressing up double entendres with fancy word smithery. But re-watching today, my memory really downplayed just how smutty they were. For something that went out at 8pm, there's a particularly crude joke hidden away at the start of episode 2. Three nights later at Great Bardling's Woodstock, the country house of Lady Penelope Barclay Hunt. Thistles in me hair and bracken up the anus. Amid all this, the raspberry blower remains elusive, frightening. <laughs> After attacking the Prime Minister's butler, the villain next targets Barker's Randy Pantryman. Very good, my lady. The same as usual. The same as usual, James. The raspberry blowings are all framed like gruesome murders, aping the visual and oral language of pulp horror. Aside from the obvious Jack the Ripper, whether intentional or not, there's a definite Spring Hill Jack vibe too. A Victorian bogeyman, somewhere between prankster, paranormal cryptid and mass hysteria. Though he never killed anyone, Spring Hill Jack's MO was jumping out of shadows, or straight up knocking women's doors to scare them into a fainting fit. I'd be surprised if they hadn't taken some visual inspiration from the images of Jack in Victorian Penny Dreadfuls, particularly this moment with the cape. It's possible there's some of Lon Chaney from London After Midnight in there too. But it's not all frights, as this is the two Ronnies, and completely stuffed with jokes and silliness. Look at the stock footage through the window of the handsome cab, which changes from driving to some monkeys. Or a scene involving two different characters both played by Barker, where he's replaced with an incredibly tall body double. Good evening, sir. Only to return in a scene where he's not necessary. He must be a madman. Do you think he's blown himself out? <laughs> they really run the full gamut of humour. There's puns. It's all so pointless. Oh, sorry, sir. <laughs> Fourth wall breaking. A seemingly hopeless task. Pardon? No, I didn't speak. Uh, how could even the great inspector corner of the yard? Innuendo. Get back. Parsons, and I'll come and give you one. I realise I'm pressing you, nurse, but it must be obvious that I have very little alternative. <laughs> Silly names. Home Secretary, Sir Doddington Diddle. Ludwig von Koch, famous Chinese ornithologist. As a child, this bit was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. And I remember driving my family up the wall, mimicking it round the house. Her ladyship's private police force worked tirelessly through the night questioning suspicious characters. Here, I want to work with you. <laughs> I want to work with you. Here, I want to work with you. We even get a random classic to Ronnie's musical number. Go through the facts. One at a time. When the assailant left, he made a most peculiar noise. He shocked the Duchess, 
man on crutches and three small boys. <laughs> the pantry man, Jim. What happened to him? He's harder faded away. <laughs> While I'm discussing the Ronnies, I can't not mention the Smith and Jones Two Ninnies sketch, which took them to task over lyrics about tits and bums, leaving Barker apoplectic with rage. We're titting up and down on the willy bum bum. We're looking around with the cobblers nobblers, tippling along with a pain in the bonkers, tippling about in the bum As great as most of the Phantom is, any old telly runs the risk of stuff that's aged like a forgotten banana. What's happened, milady? It must be the shock. Quick, call a witch doctor. The shock of the attack turned her ladyship's hair white and her face black. For the time being, she is being held as an illegal immigrant. <laughs> Barker's impression of Jewish Prime Minister Disraeli feels like it was written by Kanye West. I'll tell you, Mr. Gladstone, I can buy the Suez Canal for your own phone. <laughs> Believe me, I say I'll get it, I'll get it. <laughs> As a result, there's a sharp intake of breath when they hold an identity parade. But then we get a brilliant cameo. That's the man! <laughs> no, I'm the inspector. Number one. No, no. And this fantastic embarrassed vicar. Oh. 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 <laughs> My knees, are they? That's where Mr. Miyagi got it from. But we're here for beginner hauntology, and one of the most unsettling scenes really utilises that sense of unease from stuttery old film stock, resembling crime scene footage of a corpse being dredged out of the Thames. The Duchess was rendered unconscious by a series of gigantic raspberries. <laughs> Such a lurid setting gives more comically surreal scenes a queasy sheen. Fake horses and mannequins, a meeting of foreign leaders, some of whom are dummies, one who's got a pumpkin for a head. The atmosphere is on point at all times, with immaculately framed visuals of the killer. Similar cares taken with the funny bits, like a beautiful miniature shot of a hospital, and Terry Gilliam-style animations of Queen Victoria being farted on. The phantom striking all over London is an excuse to fill the place with blow-offs. <laughs> Despite the credits, according to legend, all the farts were performed by David Jason, which he confirmed in his autobiography. But he's also said he was almost a Monty Python, Frank Spencer, Corporal Jones in Dad's Army, and turned down Father Ted, and would probably tell you he was meant to be Robocop if he overheard you talking about it. So we'll leave that as a maybe. <laughs> Every episode ends on a cliffhanger, and another joke about letting off. The world was to hear more from the phantom raspberry blower of old London town. <laughs> Over the weeks it follows the serial crime format, piling up both victims and potential suspects, like a vengeful whoopee cushion manufacturer or an escapee from the local asylum. In a nod to Ripper lore, there's even a suggestion the blower could be a member of the royal family. Oh. <laughs> Edward. Edward, that noise. Is it possible? Could it be that our own Edward, Prince of Wales, is the dreaded monster? Although this scene returns to an earlier comic motif. 
Why don't you find yourself a nice girl, a nice Jewish girl? Bring her home, meet your mother. Hey, Mama, you're not Jewish. I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish, he says. What can make the <laughs> They seem to be a running theme with them in general. And just like the Ripper, he sends a gloating communique to the police. Dear Inspector, you'll never catch me alive. Ha ha ha. Come along to the graveyard at midnight. I will reveal my true identity. The Phantom Raspberry, etc, etc. After a fruitless search at the local bedlam. I can't seem to get on with people. You fat old pig. And having evaded all attempts at capture, the Phantom lures the cops to a midnight meeting at the graveyard. It's this scene which really stuck in young viewers' minds. Even though it's just Ronnie Corbett running round in his underwear, if you put this in a Dracula movie, it wouldn't be in the least bit out of place. <laughs> Throughout the series, they do a good job of keeping the Phantom's face hidden, and the final horrifying payoff really lives up to expectations. Eventually, he's cornered at Queen Victoria's New Year's Eve procession, taking refuge in the sewer. We know you're down there. Give yourself up. <laughs> in the Six Dates with Barker version, this scene was shot in Rillington Place, outside the former home of serial killer John Christie, even making use of the same manhole he'd used to hide the body of his wife. Rather than Barker being a true crime ghoul, most likely it was just an easy filming location, as the street had been vacated for demolition and was close to the studio. They smoke him out by playing back a recording of his own raspberry, and London is saved. You will never take me alive! I'd rather my weapon was turned upon myself! <laughs> Would law-abiding citizens be subjected to terrifying attacks from the rear? Or is it? Like all great horror villains, they're never really dead, just waiting. <laughs> Almost 50 years on, the phantom raspberry blower of old London town really holds up, thanks to an incredible attention to detail and the Ron's devotion to battering their audience with gags. With direction, production design, music, lighting, it really nails the genre spookiness. And it's easy to see why it's so often cited as a first memory of being really afraid by television. I mean, how many nightmares resulted from this startling image? Yeah, I want to work with you. <laughs>